Thank you. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. At question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to concentrate my first question today on the announcement this morning that the Grangemouth refinery will shut after 100 years of operation. The decision to close Scotland's only refinery will see 400 jobs lost directly at Grangemouth. This is a devastating blow to the workforce, the Falkirk area and the entire Scottish economy. Supporting the employees at this difficult time must be the priority of both of Scotland's governments. A PwC report published this morning said that the economic contribution of the refinery, supply chain and employee spending was £403.6 million in 2023 and it is estimated to support 2,800 jobs across Scotland. So can I ask the First Minister to outline his government's response to this announcement and say what support the Scottish Government will put in place to support the employees at this difficult time? First Minister. President, also, this is a profoundly serious issue and my first thoughts at the outset of this, the handling of this issue is with the workforce who will face great uncertainty as a consequence of the announcement that has been made this morning by Petro Ineos. There has been extensive engagement and dialogue between the Scottish Government and the United Kingdom Government with Petro Ineos about this issue, and both governments have made the case for refining to be continued for as long as it was possible, and certainly not for the announcement to be made today that refining will, uh, be, closed, will be ending in quarter two of 2025, because Mr Ross is correct, that will raise significant economic implications for Scotland. It was for this reason that I raised this issue in my first conversation with the Prime Minister on the 5th of July after the election, and there has been good and sustained engagement with the UK Government on this question. Uh, this morning, both governments have announced that the approval of the Falkirk and Grangemouth growth deal which will see the investment of £100 million of investment in the locality, which will uh, provide assistance for the locality to recover from this significant economic shock. There will secondly be immediate career support for workers made available uh, in tailored support to support employees to find employment um, uh, should they face those, uh, those, those issues. And thirdly, there will be investment in the site's long-term future. The Scottish Government and the United Kingdom Government have both jointly funded the Project Willow study, which has identified a shortlist of credible options to begin the building of a new long-term industry at the refinery site, including low-carbon hydrogen, clean e-fuels and sustainable aviation fuels. And we will put in all effort that we can to support the workforce uh, at this very, very difficult and worrying time. There will be a intense dialogue with the trade unions, with the company, with Falkirk Council on these questions, and I give Parliament the assurance that we will update members uh, as the events take their course. But the Government's commitment uh, and our commitment to work with, collaboratively with the United Kingdom Government is absolute to support the workers of Grangemouth in their time of need. I think it's absolutely right that this Parliament is united in supporting those workers uh, at this difficult time. And Scottish Conservative members for Central Scotland uh, and indeed our entire group uh, will work with both governments uh, to assist in any way uh, we can. Uh, can I move to uh, another issue that has been dominating uh, many of the conversations we've all been having with constituents uh, in the last few weeks? The winter fuel payment, shamelessly cut by the Labour government at Westminster, was devolved here to the Scottish Government. Here in Scotland, the decision not to pay this money to pensioners is one for the SNP Scottish Government. In announcing their decision to scrap the winter fuel payment, the SNP must have known the impact this is going to have on 900,000 pensioners here in Scotland. Labour said this policy would kill thousands of pensioners across the United Kingdom. And due to our colder climate, a disproportionate number of those are likely to be in Scotland. So does the First Minister accept that his government's decision will lead to unnecessary deaths here in Scotland? And if so, how many? Minister. <coughs> Mr. Well, sir, I, I deeply regret the fact that the Scottish Government finds itself in the position that we find ourselves in. We fully expected 
the devolution of the winter fuel payment issue to the Scottish Government, and we're planning to, uh, to pay that, uh, that, that, that support to pensioners in Scotland on a universal basis. That was our plan, yeah. that's what we were working on. And with 90 minutes notice, we were abruptly told that our budget would be cut by £160 million because of the decision of the United Kingdom Government. So this is not of our making or planning, and it certainly is not of our choice. But Mr Ross also knows that the Scottish Government, once we have established a budget for the year, we cannot increase the size of that budget unless there are positive consequential funding decisions from the United Kingdom Government. In this case, we have had a negative consequential financial decision which cuts our budget by £160 million. So I very much regret the fact that we will not be able to make these payments on a universal basis, but we have suffered a budget cut from the United Kingdom Government and the Scottish Government is responding to that accordingly. Douglas Ross. It was a straightforward question, so I'll ask it again. Does John Swinney believe... Let's hear Mr Ross. Thank you. Does John Swinney believe, as a result of the decision taken by SNP ministers here in Scotland, there will be unnecessary deaths, and if so, how many? He must know. But John Swinney also said, presiding officer, it was always the plan to continue to deliver this payment universally. That is not true. The Scottish Government's response to the consultation on the Pension Age winter heating payment, published in May, long before the Labour Government's announcement, said this. We will continue to review the eligibility and scope of the Pension Age winter fuel uh, heating payment moving forward. The SNP were considering cutting that payment back in May. It, Let in us hear Mr Ross. It's in black and white in their own document. Now, politics is about choices, and John Swinney's government has chosen to pass on labour cuts which could see 900,000 Scottish pensioners losing out. The SNP could have mitigated against those cuts. They have a budget of over £50 billion. And just this week, we have seen Can we have a question, Mr. Just Ross? this week, we have seen the bloated Scottish Government civil service reach a record high. So can I ask John Swinney, why are public sector pen pushers more important to him than stopping pensioners freezing in their homes? First Minister. In his last weeks in office as Conservative leader, Douglas Ross really is plumbing the depths in the questions that he puts to Parliament today. His uh, interpretation of the document, I think, is a vindication of that comment. Douglas Ross knows full well the way in which the finances of the Scottish Government operate. If we suffer a cut in our budget of £160 million, courtesy of the Labour Government, yep. we have got to respond to that and we have got to act accordingly. Now, I need no lessons from Douglas Ross about mitigating decisions of the United like Kingdom it. government, because this government is mitigating a series of decisions yeah. taken by Douglas Ross and his colleagues yeah. on an ongoing basis yeah. about the bedroom tax and uh, other measures where we picked up the pieces because of the odious decisions yeah. taken yeah. by the Conservative yeah. government yeah. in London. Yeah. So I will take no lessons from Douglas Ross on that point. But then. Douglas Ross says to me there are choices. Of course there are choices. If we followed the Conservatives on what they have said about tax and spending, I wouldn't be cutting the budget by £160 million. I'd be cutting it by £2 billion, yeah. because that's the reality of the Conservative position that they put to Parliament. So I'm going to take no lessons today from Douglas Ross, as he desperately clutches for straws in his last weeks in office. Douglas Ross. Minister, First Minister, standing up for Scotland's pensioners is not clutching at straws. And isn't it telling? Isn't it telling that John Swinney has now twice been asked 
how many people in Scotland could die as a result of his policy and he refuses to answer. It is in black and white that the SNP were considering this in May of this year. They repeatedly call for more powers, but when they're given the chance to act, they run in the opposite direction and blame West Westminster. Surely the point of devolution is to make different choices, especially when Mr. lives Ross, are Mr. at Mr Ross, I just find it very difficult to hear, as I'm sure others are too. Let's conduct ourselves in a courteous and respectful manner. Let's hear one another. Mr Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I was saying surely the point of devolution is to make different choices, especially when lives are at risk. You can't oppose Labour cuts at Westminster and simply pass them on at Holyrood, all while pretending there are nothing you can do about it. Scotland is colder than the rest of the UK. Winter fuel payments must be an even greater priority here. The £160 million cost of these payments is just a fraction, 0.3% of the Scottish Government's £50 billion budget. Surely the SNP Government can find the money if it's important to them. So why is keeping pensioners warm this winter not a priority for John Swinney? First Minister. Douglas Ross uh, raised the question, presiding officer, about the exercise of new powers. So, when this government has, when this government acquired new powers, we took decisions to, for example, uh, ask people in higher earners to contribute more in taxation in Scotland. I think that was the right decision to make because what that's enabled us to do is to fund the expansion of early learning and childcare so that families across the country have got the best childcare offering in the whole of the United Kingdom. I'm very proud that our government has put that in place. It's enabled us to spend over £400 million on uh, ensuring that we deliver the Scottish Child Payment, which is contributing to, amongst other measures, keeping 100,000 children out of yeah. poverty. Now, there's the exercise of choices yes. that we have made as a government, and I'm very proud of them. But the difficulty we face on the issue about winter fuel payments is that within this, within this Let's financial... Let's hear the First Minister. Within this financial year, our budget is being cut. At the same time, as we are affording uh, pay increases for public sector workers, nurses, nurses... First Minister, I mean, quite frankly, members know that they are not conducting themselves in a courteous and respectful manner. Where there have been previous opportunities to put questions, I would ask members to focus and listen. First Minister. So, we, at the same time as we've got a budget cut of £160 million about winter fuel payments, we are affording over £800 million of additional costs to meet the costs of pay bills so that teachers and uh, nurses and other members of the public services who are delivering vital services in our country. Why are you still shouting at me, Mr Hoy? Yeah. You've got to listen to the presiding officer. Yeah. You've got to listen to the presiding officer and stop behaving badly. First Minister. I can assure the First Minister that I am wholly prepared to chair this meeting. I will not have members... I will not have any members shouting at one another. So let's start to conduct ourselves in an appropriate manner for this Parliament. First Minister. So, so Presiding Officer, within the financial year that we face, where we have an acute cut to our budget of the winter fuel payments, this Government has been left with no choice. But what I will say to Douglas Ross is that I will take absolutely no lesson from Douglas Ross who supported every act of financial vandalism of the last Conservative government, every act of austerity which is leading to suffering amongst pensioners and families in our country, and the Conservatives have got no lessons to teach us. Question number two, Jackie Bailey. Presiding officer, this morning Petro Ineos have confirmed their decision to decommission the refinery at Grangemouth. For the workforce, their families, as well as the wider community, I know this will be a time of great anxiety. Since the refinery closure was first proposed, Labour have called for both 
of Scotland's governments to get round the table to find solutions. And that's why Keir Starmer raised the issue with the First Minister during his first visit to Scotland after the election. And that's why the clear message this morning is that the UK Labour government is ready to support the workforce and secure a viable long-term future for the site. Like me, I am sure the First Minister welcomes this assurance. Can I ask, will he join with me in committing to continue the work with the UK Government in the interests of the Grangemouth community and Scotland's energy security? First Minister. I am very happy to uh, give that confirmation to Parliament today. That has been the spirit in which the Scottish Government has operated since the, uh, the issues were raised by Petra and yours some months ago. Um, certainly since the change of government in July, um, uh, we, we've had uh, sustained engagement. There was actually sustained engagement before that, but uh, it's carried on under the new government. And as I explained in my first answer to Mr Ross, uh, there is a, a series of measures that the United Kingdom government and the Scottish government have announced uh, this morning, which are designed to address the immediate issues. But I do give Jackie Bailey the assurance that the Scottish government will concentrate and focus on meeting the needs of the workforce at what I acknowledge will be an extremely worrying time for them. Jackie Bailey. I very much welcome that commitment from the First Minister. Um, the plan announced today delivers a 100 million fund to drive growth in Grangemouth and support the workforce, investment in new energy projects and a new technology centre to support the use of low carbon technologies, career and skills support for the existing workforce and an employment hub to support emerging energy sectors and exploring new potential opportunities for Labour's National Wealth Fund in clean technologies like hydrogen and clean aviation fuel. All of this has been pulled together in the first nine weeks of a UK Labour government, and it gives the hope of a strong industrial energy future at Grangemouth. I welcome the joint investment by both governments. Does the First Minister agree that this shows how the people of Scotland benefit from the Labour government's approach to cooperation rather than conflict? Minister. I think on, on, on a matter of fact, actually, and, I, and I, 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 I have to be fair on this question, there was a lot of dialogue with the previous Conservative government on this, on this issue. But I, I, you know, so I, think for, I think to be absolutely fair, um, this issue has been taken seriously by the United Kingdom government of whatever colour, and it's certainly been taken deadly seriously by the Scottish government. Um, and uh, the Project Willow study, which is a really important part of research about uh, viable alternatives for development of the site um, uh, predates the existing government, so it's, uh, but I'm glad that that's been supported as a consequence of the announcements today. Um, I agree very much about the basis of cooperation. It's no secret that the Scottish Government would like the United Kingdom Government to move faster on the authorising of the ACORN carbon capture and storage project. It has been a subject of deep concern to me that uh, promises that were made to me directly by ministers in the last United Kingdom government have not been fulfilled about the authorisation of that scheme. And I feel deeply let down by the fact that that has not happened. And promises were given and they have not been fulfilled. So it's a point I have made to the Prime Minister that an early authorisation of the ACORN carbon capture and storage uh, project would be a significant boost to the efforts to find new opportunities in the Grangemouth site. And I do hope the United Kingdom Government is listening carefully to the words I'm saying to Parliament today. Thank you, Bailey. I think you'll find the government has not just been listening carefully, but has been acting mm. in the interests of the people of Scotland. And of course, a new national wealth fund um, is something that didn't exist before the Labour government came to power. And that can make change happen. And a UK Labour government working with the Scottish government is part of the promise we made to Scots at the general election. Labour made a commitment that we would not leave communities behind. And that's why we've got on with passing the legislation to set up GB Energy, awarded a record-breaking number of clean energy contracts, announcing this 100 million support package for Grangemouth alongside the Scottish Government, protecting Scotland's industrial base, securing the well-paid jobs Let's of the future, Ms. Bailey. and delivering the transition to net zero. This new consensus doesn't appear to have lasted long on the SNP-backed benches. But there is more 
we could and should be doing here in Scotland. It's taken three years for the SNP to publish a green industrial strategy. So whilst I welcome the enthusiasm with which the First Minister has engaged with the UK Labour government in the last few weeks, does he agree that to deliver new investment, good jobs and energy security for Scotland, we need to step up action here as well? First Minister. There's, there's, there's plenty of action on green energy and uh, green opportunities in Scotland. Uh, just one of my first engagements as First Minister was to announce the investment at the Ardes Airport in, near Inverness, uh, followed by uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Net Zero announcing the investment at Sumitomo in NIG, which is a, another formidable investment in the renewable sector. And just on Monday, I had the pleasure of being in Bucky. For the, uh, to inaugurate the uh, uh, operations and maintenance facility of Ocean Wind, who are leading the development of the Murray East and Murray West offshore renewables plant, uh, wind, 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 wind farm. Now, that's all happening on the watch of the Scottish Government, and I'm delighted that that's happening. Now, Jackie Bailey is, is, is right. We've got to intensify the pace, which is why the Green Industrial Strategy has been published. We'd also be helped if we perhaps had access to, or actually had control over the £150 million uh, of the war chest that apparently the Secretary of State for Scotland has got at his disposal. Because if, 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 if the funding arrangements were working properly, we would have here for us to invest in the Scottish economy to accelerate developments and perhaps to put even more than we've already put into the carbon capture and storage project that I was talking about a moment ago. So I'm all for working together. Yep. But let's make sure we've got the resources here by the end to austerity, which allows us to invest in the economy. And while we're on the subject of promises and what's been delivered by the Labour government, the Labour government promised that it would reduce people's fuel bills by £300 and they are going to go up by £149 on average. That is not the change that people voted for in Scotland. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. I certainly agree with the First Minister and others that our thoughts today must be with the workforce and the community affected by the announcement regarding Grangemouth. But the truth is that the Government has been well aware for years that Grangemouth urgently needed a just transition plan. And yesterday's so-called green industrial strategy contained nothing new to achieve a fair transition away from polluting industries. So the workforce and the community have been failed by the private owners, but they've been failed by both governments too. Why has the Scottish Government produced a green industrial strategy that looks like it was written by oil and gas lobbyists and which contained no transition plan for Grangemouth? First Minister. Uh, I, 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 well, I welcome the comments that Mr Harvey has put on the record about the workforce at Grangemouth. I don't think it's a laughing matter, to be honest, to the Conservatives no. uh, about the no. hardship that's faced by the employees at Grangemouth. Yeah. Um, uh, but, so I welcome the comments that Mr Harvey has put on the record about the workforce, because I think it is important that Parliament acts with solidarity when members of the public yeah. face difficulties. Yeah. But in relation to the Green Industrial Strategy, uh, amongst the, the five opportunity areas in the Green Industrial Strategy, the first one of them is about investment in the wind industry, which is a formidable contributor towards our Green Industrial Strategy. Um, I know that Mr Harvey takes a different view to the Government on carbon capture and storage, but it's an important uh, element of our Green Industrial Strategy as are the development of financial products that will enable investment in the self-same renewable energy industries that I have talked about, or the development of hydrogen possibilities, which have got enormous significance uh, with the export potential that can, be, uh, can arise out of the investment we are making in offshore wind. So I hope some of that detail gives Mr Harvey confidence that the Green Industrial Strategy is meeting the needs of both the workforce at Grangemouth, but also uh, applies across the Scottish economy in providing new opportunities for transition. Yeah. Patrick Harvey. Look, the news about Grangemouth this week makes it all the more important that the government is truly honest about its climate action, but they didn't even want to tell Parliament about their legally required plan to make up for their missed 
targets. They slipped it out on Friday with no debate, no statement to Parliament, not even a press release uh, on that legally required report. And no wonder they're embarrassed by it. It's supposed to show what new climate action they're going to take to make up for falling further behind on climate. But it contains no new policy whatsoever. And this after they spent the last few weeks abandoning policies that the Greens achieved in government. They've raided the Nature Restoration Fund and the Scotland money. And they're planning a big increase in rail fares, which the Greens had cut. So how can they publish this report with literally no new policy in it and still expect to be taken seriously while they're rushing through a new climate bill that kicks this ever more urgent issue into ever longer grass. First Minister. I think it's important that we look at all of the detail that's relevant in this area. So, for example, in the programme for government that I announced last Wednesday, we set out our investment programme for a, a just transition fund in the North East and in Murray. We set out our plans to significantly enhance the capacity uh, of Scotland to generate renewable energy. And of course, we've made formidable progress on the decarbonisation of electricity since this yeah. government came to power um, and uh, uh, achieved significant improvements in uh, that process. Um, the programme for government included material about um, the expansion or the restoration of uh, 10,000 hectares of degraded peatland and the creation of 10,000 hectares of woodlands. And there's a variety of other measures in the programme for government that support our work on climate change. And I want to be crystal clear to, to Mr Harvey that the government is absolutely committed to the journey we've got to take on climate. That's underpinned our activities since we came to office in 2007 and it will underpin our activities in the years to come. This transition has got to be made. It has to be made fairly for all communities involved and that's the approach the Scottish Government will take. Thank you. I call Bob Doris. Question number four. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government's plans to improve the planning and consenting regime for renewable energy generation can support the journey to net zero. Minister. Presiding Officer, robust and timely planning and consenting of renewable energy projects and infrastructure are key to growing our economy and delivering on our net zero commitments. Um, the steps that we take in relation to providing clarity and confidence to support renewables development and investment are critical to enable Scotland's transition to net zero. That is why I set out in the programme for government last week a set of actions to, to deliver improvements that we need to see in the current regime. These include establishing Scotland's first ever planning hub to build capacity and skills in planning teams with an initial focus on hydrogen applications, making consenting faster and more consistent for proposals over 50 megawatts, introducing new guidance for transmission developments and updating our marine planning framework. Doris. Uh, I think the first minister answered the, the, the green industrial strategy will be key in that context for Scotland's drive to net zero by 2045 and promoting a just transition. First Minister, can you advise how the actions set out in that strategy will help Scotland to secure both growth and investment? But it goes beyond renewable energy also. So what details can you give that's contained in that strategy about how it will support decarbonisation, for instance, of the built environment and construction sector, given it generates 40 per cent of emissions? First Minister. So, so Mr Doris makes a number of very important points in relation to the Green Industrial Strategy and the steps that we have to take. Um, as I outlined in my answer to Mr Harvey, there are five key opportunity areas where we need to take um, further action on uh, the transition in relation to investment, innovation and entrepreneurship uh, in a number of sectors, wind, carbon capture and storage, professional financial services, hydrogen and clean industries. Um, we already have formidable leadership in this area, but Mr Dollars is right to raise the issue of the construction sector and the need for it to reduce its emissions. Uh, we are working in collaboration with the construction sector on decarbonisation through the Construction Leadership Forum and its codes which set out agreed actions on decarbonisation. Keen to take as many members as possible for supplementaries, if we can keep these concise, and I call Tess White. First Minister, the North East is, ex is experiencing a dramatic increase in new transmission infrastructure to serve offshore wind. Effective communities do deserve proper consultation, but that has been far from the case. For residents bearing the brunt of this new infrastructure, this feels like an unfair 
and an unjust transition. And as the Scottish Government looks to improve the planning and consenting regime for renewables, you describe it as making consenting faster, would the First Minister be willing to meet with the community representatives and campaigners to listen to their concerns and to ensure they are not being left behind? First Minister. I think it's very important that there is a good quality, high quality community engagement about all developments of any nature. It's, that, that actually helps to make the consenting and planning process more efficient. If those who are taking forward developments engage in good dialogue and a good engagement with individual communities. I am very familiar with the issues that Tess White raises and I am um, sure ministers would be happy to, uh, to meet campaigners. Of course, ministers have to be careful about the engagement they have on particular developments because of the need to observe the ministerial code in taking decisions on these questions. Tim Whitfield. I'm very grateful, Presiding Officer. And I welcome the fact that you're seeking to make consenting faster because the First Minister is aware that delays have affected such things as Berwick Bank offshore wind. Um, so, in his role as First Minister, could he facilitate a meeting regarding the Eskdale Muir seismic array in Dumfries and Galloway, which is causing problems with regards to um, community wind powers development there? First Minister. Uh, on Individual applications. I think I will generally just take the view that I will not say anything in Parliament because that keeps me on the right side of the ministerial code. I'm not sure the status of the application that Mr Whitfield raises with me, um, but uh, I will take that away and uh, consider whether it's appropriate for ministers to engage because I, 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 I don't know the stage of that application and it would be careless for me uh, to say otherwise. Beatrice Wishart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Shetland is the windiest part of the country, so for obvious reasons it attracts both onshore and offshore wind developments. Islanders are aware of the contributions such projects make to re reach net zero, but there is a view that onshore developments should not be built near existing properties and communities. Does the First Minister recognise the concerns about the proximity of wind turbines to homes and the impact of turbine noise and shadow flicker? And what can the Scottish Government do in terms of planning and consent to ensure a specified minimum distance between properties and future onshore wind developments? First Minister. Yeah, I understand the significance of the issues that Beatrice Bishop puts to me. And, um, I, I, and my, my, my view would be that the issues that she raises should be properly and fully considered in any planning process. Um, I am very happy to consider whether there are enhancements to the process that need to be undertaken to provide the reassurance that uh, she seeks. Uh, I am also very conscious from uh, some of the dialogue I have had with representatives of the community in Shetland of some of the concerns that are raised about developments and also the relationship between power generation in the Shetland Islands with um, the cost of energy yeah. for local residents, which I recognise is a very, very significant issue. So I am very happy to have further dialogue with uh, Beatrice Wisher on that question. Question number five, Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to recent reports regarding Police Scotland's policy on self identification for individuals charged with or convicted of serious sexual assaults. First Minister. President Officer, the Scottish Government is clear that violence against women and girls is abhorrent. Through our equally safe strategy, we are aiming to prevent and tackle such violence and abuse and address the underlying attitudes and behaviours that perpetuate the violence that too many experience. It is only through fundamental societal change that women can be protected. The Chamber is well aware the Scottish Government does not determine or interfere with operational matters of Police Scotland, which is accountable to the Scottish Police Authority and not to Ministers. Rachel Hamilton. Thank the First Minister for that answer. But in a letter to a Holyrood Committee, Police Scotland said they would allow a serious sex offender to self-declare their gender. This opens the door to a grotesque situation where a male rapist can demand to be called a woman and further <coughs> traumatise his victim. Echoing language of the SNP, Police Scotland said that, I quote, this was consistent with their values and promotes a strong sense of belonging. This is an insult to the victims of rape and serious assault. The only strong sense this should inspire is disgust. Does the First Minister agree with me and women across Scotland that male rapists shouldn't get their own way, or is he content to let another Isla Bryson situation happen? First Minister. 
let me be absolutely crystal clear with Parliament. I have never in my life believed or will ever believe, in the words of Rachel Hamilton, that a male rapist should get his way. I will not be associated with that language. And, the, and our law and our legal framework makes that abundantly clear. Now, in relation to the specific question about the guidance from Police Scotland, these are operational matters for Police Scotland. There would be outrage if I was to interfere in the actions and the decision-making of Police Scotland, and, it's, and, and the, the law is clear that I cannot do that. But I am sure that Police Scotland will have heard the exchanges in Parliament today and will consider the issues, if there are any issues that they wish to address. Pauline McNeill. Behind the recording of crime statistics are real victims such as the women who had to sit through court proceedings last year. And here the rapist referred to as a woman. I don't really think the First Minister can ignore responsibility because Police Scotland, as said by Rachel Hamilton, has said it's consistent with their values. But I think the government needs to be clear, is it consistent with their values? And if a message is to go from the First Minister today, does it not make a mockery of the government's violence against women strategy if violent male offenders can present as women and this could be accepted by the police? Is that critical? First Minister. The, 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 the government's strategy in relation to the tackling of violence against women is absolutely crystal clear that there is no place for violence against women in our society. Absolutely crystal clear. And the perpetrators of that violence must be confronted with their behaviour and, their beha and must be held to account for their behaviour. That is the foundation of our legal system. Now, Polly McNeill is a very experienced commentator and parliamentarian on issues in relation to justice policy. She knows that I cannot interfere in the operational business of Police Scotland. Indeed, the law prevents me from doing so. But the issues are, uh, have been aired here in Parliament today, and Police Scotland will have the opportunity to consider them. Ash Regan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Just to further underline this issue that we're discussing, stories have actually been running in the media this year discussing the increase in women committing sex crimes, when the reality, of course, is that these crimes are committed by men and they are being recorded as women's crimes. Absolutely. This is offensive to women and it is grossly disrespectful yeah, yeah. to the victims of these crimes. So why are Scottish institutions still acting as if self-ID is the law when it is not? Institutions, however, do have legal obligations through the public sector equality duty to record sex accurately. Will the First Minister show leadership and address this horrible situation urgently? First Minister. Uh, President Officer, the, in the last published year of data, the, for which data is available, 21-22, all convictions of rape or attempted rape were perpetrated by males. That's a statement of fact in relation to the most recent data that's available. I acknowledge the concerns that are being expressed in Parliament today, but I come back to the fundamental point that the recording of information on those committing crime is an operational matter for Police Scotland. They must be accountable for the decisions that they take, and it is not for the First Minister to interfere or specify in operational matters of Police Scotland. Question number six, Carol Malkin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking in response to reported rise in hospice care costs, including to ensure that employees in that sector have pay parity with NHS staff. First Minister. Presiding Officer, independent hospices are highly valued and provide vital support to people and their families, as well as supporting other local health and social care services and teams delivering palliative care. I understand the pressures that hospices are currently facing and the Scottish Government uh, strives to support independent hospices where possible. Um, there has been engagement and dialogue with the hospice sector, and the Minister for Public Health and Women's Health is meeting with Hospice UK and the Chair of the Scottish Hospice Leadership Group next week to discuss support options in more detail. 
Carol Malkin. Thank you. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Given hospice care is so valued, does the First Minister recognise urgent action is needed? The sector is under serious financial constraints and threats of closure. The Government must ensure the hospice workforce do not conclude that they are undervalued and leave the sector. Hospices simply cannot take that impact. So I ask what action, what action will the First Minister take today, right now, to reassure hospices and their workforce? First Minister. First, first of all, let, let me make it clear that I deeply value and the Government deeply values the work of the hospice sector uh, and it's, I, I understand the financial challenges that are faced because of the wider um, uh, pay deals that are being put in place or, or being consulted upon in relation to Agenda for Change, which creates difficulties for the hospice sector. Uh, there is ministerial engagement to address these questions and that will be taken forward as a consequence of the discussions and the points that have been raised by Carol Mockin today. Miles Briggs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In 2012, Ministers put in place a Chief Executive letter for hospices across Scotland. That resulted in a very welcome situation which saw funding mutually agreed between the Government and the hospices of around 50% calculation of agreed costs. That has collapsed since this letter has uh, now not been taken and the integration of health and social care to around 25-28% to of funding for hospices across Scotland. We need to see that change, First Minister. So can I ask um, what future models of funding are the Scottish Government going to look at to ensure that we have a built-in mechanism to take into account these pay costs and additional costs faced by the whole hospice sector? First Minister. Miles Briggs is correct that the arrangements that um, were previously in place were superseded by the introduction of the Public Bodies Joint Working Scotland Act 2014. Uh, now, as a consequence of that act, it became the responsibility of integrated joint boards to plan and resource adult palliative care services for their area, including hospice services based on local needs. And that's the, the route by which these funding arrangements are resolved. Um, we, will, we will continue to engage on these questions to determine what is the best approach to take to meet local needs, which of course will vary from different, from different parts of the, the country. And uh, the Minister's meeting next week provides us the opportunity to reflect further on these questions. Thank you. We move to general and constituency supplementaries, and I call Michelle Thompson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. My thoughts are first and foremost with the workers at the refinery in Grangemouth, for whom today's announcement will be a shock, if not a surprise. I am also very mindful of the community for whom a just transition will feel too far away. As a constituency MSP, I will be doing everything in my power to sustain the life of the refinery and to ensure it and the important chemical cluster around it can be supported. Can I note that the £100 million quoted by the UK Government and Labour Party includes £80 million already agreed as part of the growth deal for the wider Falkirk district, that this included £50 million from the Scottish Government and that these funds will not be solely focused on Grangemouth? However, I can today make the Chamber aware that I have been working with a third party who hopes to purchase the refinery in its entirety. The matter, of course, is commercially sensitive and confidential, but will the First Minister meet with me so that I can share what information I can with the permission of the potential buyer? First Minister. Uh, sir, sir, I'm very happy to do so. Uh, it's, uh, this is a very uh, unnerving time for the workforce, and it's important that uh, we all act in a way to make sure that there are good and positive opportunities for members of staff as they face uh, such an anxious time. So I'm very happy to explore all possibilities, but I reiterate what I've put on the record already today, that the Scottish Government stands to support the workforce at Grangemouth to find the best way forward in these difficult circumstances. Brian Whittle. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware that the Commonwealth Games will no longer be taking place in Australia in 2026. However, Australia have offered this uh, uh, £100 million to underwrite uh, if, if, if it's taken to Scotland. There's a further £50 million available from ticket sales and sponsorship. And there is a guarantee from the Commonwealth Council that the Commonwealth Games will be fully funded without the need for any Scottish Government intervention. 
Does the First Minister agree with me that the opportunity to bring the Games back to Scotland would be a fantastic event to promote Scotland to the world and to highlight sporting excellence to the Scottish public? First Minister. I think the, we, we all have very fond memories of the Commonwealth Games in 2014, which were a marvellous spectacle. But I think it is important that uh, everybody who is considering and discussing this issue is aware that the proposal that has been brought forward um, would not be a replication of the Commonwealth Games of 2014. It would be a significantly reduced proposition compared to 2014. Uh, there is also uh, some very practical issues about the length of preparatory time for the Games. We had seven years to prepare in 2014. Um, there is, of course, just a matter of about, just short of two years, actually, to prepare for any Games in 2026. And there are, of course, very significant financial issues, and Mr Whittle knows the pressures uh, the, on the public purse at this time. So there are discussions underway with Commonwealth Games Scotland, to which the Government is engaging in good faith, and uh, we will continue to do so. Demo Roddick. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The link between population growth and economic growth is of particular importance in the region that I represent. Keir Starmer has said he wants to work with the Scottish Government on common ground. So what indications has the First Minister had from the UK Government that it will devolve powers to this Parliament so that a rural visa pilot for sectors like social care and hospitality can be taken forward? First Minister. So I've put that proposition to ministers in the United Kingdom government. Indeed, I discussed it specifically with the Deputy Prime Minister when she um, visited me over the summer, uh, because I think, as Emma Roddick will know from her constituency exp experience, um, there are acute shortages um, of workers in a number of sectors, and a rural visa pilot would help us to address some of the challenges that exist in Highland, which she fairly puts to me. So I would assure Emma Roddick that the government, to the Scottish Government, is pressing the UK Government to act on these issues because if they did, it would help to contribute towards stimulating further economic growth in Scotland, which I think we all would welcome. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions, and there will now be a short suspension to allow those leaving the public gallery to do so before the debate begins. Um, can I remind members that would be grateful if they could remain in the chamber? Um, that would be very helpful. Thank you.